I'm also going to take a moment to uh, introduce Matt. Um, you're all members, so you uh, have read about Matt in the past. We did feature him in several viewpoints ago. Um, he is uh, the UBC Professor of Medical Genetics, uh, Canadian Excellence Research Laureate in Applied Neurogenetics, and the Don Ricks BC Leadership Chair in Genetic Medicine. He is leading a global effort to discover new genes for Parkinson's and to accelerate the translation of these discoveries into new disease-modifying therapies. His lab has played a leading role in the discovery of every causal gene for typical late-onset Parkinson's disease, and he has also identified some of the genes for atypical and early-onset forms of Parkinsonism. His story of how he came to be involved in Parkinson's research is engaging and how it has led to his dedication to research. So I've asked Matt actually to spend uh, some time talking about his journey uh, with uh, developing his interest in Parkinson's research and then um, a little bit about some of the technical discoveries. So, because I, I thought if he did all the technical stuff, we're not gonna understand it. So I needed, I needed him to talk about the journey, which is actually really, really interesting. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fair. Well, uh, good morning. Um, thanks for coming out on such a wet and rainy day. But um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, my journey, uh, my research career uh, so far. Um, I've been working in Parkinson's disease uh, research now for 20, uh, um, what is it, 22 years. And I've been working in genetics um, since the late 1980s. So it's, it's quite a while. Um, and I can tell you a bit about where I started and, and what my motivations were. Um, I have a whole series of slides here. And they're really for me, not you, because they, they kind of nudge me to, uh, to remember to tell you pieces that I, that I would otherwise forget. <clears throat> so I, um, I was fortunate to have uh, uh, early experiences in uh, neurologic uh, health and disease because um, my mum was a cleaner in a uh, psychiatric hospital. And when I was a kid, I used to go and spend time in the psychiatric hospital. Um, I used to play there, basically run around the corridors and, and mess about and and uh, misbehave with the staff. Uh, and, uh, and I thought to myself at the time, this, is, you know, this was, this was a, an old-fashioned red brick Victorian institution in the middle of Dartmoor. Um, patients used to come in, but they never used to leave. Uh, the only escape really was death. And sometimes patients took it upon themselves to, to escape and uh, throw themselves underneath the wheels of an intercity 125 train on the way to London. And uh, so as, as a young teenager, it, it struck me that there's got to be a better way to help people with neurologic problems or, or psychiatric problems. And there were all sorts of different diagnoses and, and issues in patients uh, in that facility. Um, there were awards with psychogeriatric patients, with patients with dementia, frontal temporal lobe dementia, and patients with um, full-blown Parkinsonism. Um, there are patients with uh, full-blown schizophrenia. Um, there are the criminally insane. There is all sorts of people. Um, and I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way, because at the time, the only therapies really uh, were sedation, for the most part, um, to keep people comfortable, to help with symptom symptoms, in, in a sense. And so I thought, what, what, what would be a way to get inside the brain to find out what's going on inside the brain? And it occurred to me that DNA would be a great way to do that. Because nobody actually wants to give up a piece of their brain while they're living, uh, you know, for it to be sliced and diced and, 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 and uh, dissected. But DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is a wonderful way of, of looking at uh, the blueprint of life. Um, so I'm going to say something rather heretical. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Right? The first three verses of the Gospel of John, there's a saying there, in, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was uh, God, and I forget the rest of it, <laughs> to be honest. But um, the heresy is that, I think, I think John got it right, but the Word was DNA. You know? uh, that's my heresy. 
because it is the blueprint of life. It really gives us an idea, more than an idea, uh, of our being, of how, we're, how our biology is, is, is comprised. We have 20,390 genes. Anyway, so I started off in psychiatric and neurologic um, hospitals, and I went on and I trained in a medical school in London for a while, and then I, um, I did a PhD in uh, complex uh, uh, traits, and basically in statistical genetics and, and molecular genetics. And, um, and then I came and, and started working at, at, at Mayo Clinic um, in the States in, in the, in the mid-1990s. <coughs> And when I arrived there, I, um, at the time I wanted to work on cognition because I thought cognition was uh, the most interesting aspect of, of brain and, and brain health. And, um, but I, I got there and I, I met a fellow who was actually the, the chair of neurology, the head of neurology in Mayo Scottsdale. And he, uh, his name was Manfred Munter. And he was retiring and he'd written his life's work. And I'm going to show you some pictures about this family. He'd been working with this family since the 1950s. Um, it's actually called after him, the Spellman Munter Kindred in the medical textbooks. Um, it's been well described. Uh, the main branch of the family comes from a small village um, in Iowa, Kingsley, Iowa. And uh, it's a farming community. I've been there. There's, there's not a lot there. There's a lot of corn. <laughs> um, and uh, the the lady here in the photograph, this photograph was presented, was given to Mayo Clinic um, uh, at the turn of the last century. It's actually from 1924. The lady in the photograph here, um, you might be able to tell, she has Parkinson's disease. I don't know if you can tell that from the photograph. I think I can. Um, she's the lady who's holding the baby in a rather strange way. And her arm is bent like this in the photograph. She's got dystonia, dystonic hand posturing there. And her face, if you look at it, is rather masked, uh, expressionless, and she's standing there with her mouth agape. And if you remember at the time, well, I don't remember, but in that day and age, it wasn't a click on an iPhone, of course. You had to stand very still for the photograph for quite a while, right, to get this nice sepia photograph in 1924. So she was obviously standing in the water, like that for the duration of the time it took to take the photo. And, um, <clears throat> She has early onset Parkinson's disease. She got the disease when she was 33. And um, half of every generation, half of her siblings and every generation since uh, developed the disease. Now Mayo <coughs> was certain, and I helped write the medical textbooks, that Parkinson's disease had no genetic etiology. There is no genetic foundation in Parkinson's disease. The whole concept is nonsense, right? You read uh, Merritt's Neurology, which is a classic textbook for neurology for medical students. That's what it says. Um, so when I started out at Mayo Clinic and Manfred introduced me to this, he said, are you up for a challenge, Matt? <laughs> because uh, I think this family is genetic. And I think there are instances of families with genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. And the reason that's important is if we could find that genetic cause in those families where there is a strong heritable component to this disease. We might be able to use that as a tool to understand what's wrong in people with garden variety, sporadic Parkinson's disease, right? It's a way in, it's a way to find out what's going wrong. And to find out what's going wrong at the most fundamental DNA level, right? Uh, find out what's wrong with that blueprint, right? So, um, so he said, you're up for a challenge because the challenge will be that you'll be called an idiot, a fool by the medical community, <coughs> probably for many years and may maybe for your entire career, because I might be wrong. <laughs> and and uh, oh, well, at the time, I, I didn't really have anything to lose, right? So, <laughs> so, so I thought, oh, well, okay then. And you know what? It was such a humbling experience because I went out to Kingsley, Iowa, and I um, actually went out with a, a movement disorders resident at the time, <coughs> Katrina, and it was quite an adventure, really, driving across the country and flying different places. And, and um, got out there and, and, and found basically a, a run-down, deserted homestead. Uh, it wasn't really a farm. Um, and heard lots of stories from the neighbours about this family uh, who were afflicted by this dreadful neurodegenerative disease. And you can imagine, well, more than imagine, I imagine, many of you, 
um, what that does to family dynamics, especially when it's half of every generation, half of the preceding generation, and the disease is, it manifests at a time when your children are young and small, right? 30 years of age. Me and age one, so it's 33. So um, <clears throat> the family was quite dysfunctional, and they'd run away. And the neighbors said, uh, well, the, the mayor term for it was they were disinhibited. And they, 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 they saw that as part of the psychopathology of the disease, the disinhibition. Um, by that, I mean they had a few tattoos. Uh, the boys in the family were bikers. <laughs> they used to run up around <coughs> on, on Harleys or motorbikes up and down the farm. And, um, but basically, they were told by Mayo over many, many years, there is no genetics in Parkinson's disease. And uh, so they thought, it must be something here in the environment, in the well water, something on the farm, the pesticides, toxins. And they decided collectively as a family to run away. They ran away from each other and they ran away from, from home. And, uh, and I had the um, very humbling privilege really to, uh, to track them all down. Because to find the gene that causes their disease, I can't do it with one person. I need to do it at the minimum at the time because the methods, of, methods are better now. Uh, there's been a lot of technology advanced, but um, you need several cousin branches of the family. For an example, two siblings, a brother and sister, share 50% of their DNA, right? But if you move it at the relationship at a bit more distant, maybe uh, it's an uncle and, and, uh, and a nephew, they're, well, they're going to only share, say, a quarter of their DNA. Then you go to a cousin, they're going to share one-eighth of their DNA. Now, the genome's a big place, right? So you get three cousins, you're down to about one and 64th of their genome. If they share that, there's, and the more cousin branches you get, of course, the more likely it is that you can pin down the tiny piece of DNA that segregates down the family line on a particular chromosome, along with the pattern of, of disease inheritance. And that's what we did. It took me six years to track them all down. I remember meeting um, her granddaughter who worked uh, in, as a bank teller at the time. She just retired in her early 30s because she could no longer uh, basically do the job, count the money anymore. And, and, uh, um, but she had such a lot of hope and, and, uh, and was very kind and, and gave me a DNA sample. I met um, her grandson, Philip. That was really humbling because uh, I went to his house in Seattle, and I've told some people probably, some of you in the audience have probably heard, heard this story. I went to Seattle, and, and it was pouring down with rain, and I knocked on the door, and uh, these hell's angels answered the door, and, <laughs> and they used some rather colourful language, which I won't repeat, and uh, told me where I could go, basically. And, uh, <clears throat> and I continued to hang out outside. So, uh, so we, uh, Katrina and I got invited in, in the nicest possible way, and... Uh, and uh, long story short, anyway, they were very good, and they gave me some of their blood, too. Um, <clears throat> with enough samples, and it did take six years, we did track the gene. And, and this, is, oh, this is the branches of the family. And, uh, so that's Philip, who was in the house with them. Um, and this is, this is Myra. But these are the people. So, so the... Um, we tracked down the different branches of the family, and, and, and this was the pedigree that enabled us to map it. And it turned out to be a multiplication of the alpha-synuclein gene. And by that, I mean, the alpha, we have 20,000 genes. This one's called alpha-synuclein. Um, and in this family, they had a, uh, a 1.7 megabase multiplication. They actually have four copies of the gene, where you and I have two. And, uh, and that alone is enough to cause early onset Parkinson's disease in the family. It was enough to tell me that if you basically lower the expression of alpha synuclein, then you've potentially got a drug therapy, a therapy that will work in these families to halt the disease progression and maybe prevent it entirely. We also had now a genetic marker so we could genotype the family members and say, who's at risk? Who's actually going to get the disease? So we know who to be able to treat and who to treat early. Um, <clears throat> the clincher, really, for part of the story... So. So I've, I've worked with many families now with synuclein multiplications. This is one that I was privileged to work with, with um, in Sweden. 
And it turns out they've got some nuclear multiplication as well. They were documented by a guy called Henry Muniz back in the 1940s. That's a picture of him there. And um, Henry Muniz's son um, gave us his father's... Uh, his father collected all the paperwork uh, in his garage and he was going to throw it out, so he said, Matt, do you want it? And, <laughs> and, and uh, we've actually given it to a, a, a neurologist in, in southern Sweden who's working up this particular family. This is known as the Lister family complex. Anyway, these types of families, uh, it's a long story. I, I, won't, I could tell you all about it, but I'll spend the whole talk doing that. Um, the point is that by defining the molecular etiology of the disease, we... Um, we now had a target, we had a mechanism, and we probably have a means to treat it. It turned out that alpha-synuclein, of course, um, uh, basically is the major component that's found in Lewy body pathology. This is the pathology that's found in the brain of individuals with Parkinson's disease. The brown shouldn't be there, right? Um, it's basically, this is the typical classic Levy body or Lewy body in A. You can see this radiating. This staining is actually antibodies that have been raised to alpha-synuclein. Right, so, and this is just garden variety. Um, we know now that alpha-synuclein is the major uh, risk factor for Parkinson's disease worldwide um, in every patient. It contributes just a very, very small amount of risk in most patients. Very, very small. In the Iowa family, the Spelman Munter kindred, it um, contributes a massive amount of risk. But that information allowed um, drug companies uh, to feel safe in their investment. And there are a variety of companies now who are in phase one or phase two uh, clinical trials, um, or have finished phase two clinical trials, uh, using a variety of different methods to lower alpha synuclein, uh, which is phenomenal, because that's actually going to be, a, I think, a, a very important therapeutic for, um, for many patients with Parkinson's disease. So what I showed you a little bit of is this like translational cycle. And I, um, we start off with family and population genetics, so the bit in orange, and then kind of go around this cycle of once you find a gene, you have to do something useful with it. So you find a gene, a particular mutation in a gene, and we generally model that particular mutation in a gene and, and look at uh, what it does to, to the model. And I, I use a lot of mouse models. We make knock-ins and knock-outs and do very physiologic science. We do a lot of electrophysiology, we do a lot of imaging, we actually take that back to human subjects. And um, so I keep going. So there are many forms of Parkinsonism though, and Parkinson's disease. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jan, told me that every patient he sees is unique. There is no single Parkinson's patient, it's the same as another in terms of their initial presentation, in terms of the symptoms, in terms of their progression, none of it. Every patient is unique. So how then can we lump them all together and call it Parkinson's disease under one big umbrella and give them the same drugs and expect them all to have the same <laughs> benefit? That's what we do, right? Um, so um, I've taken the view, uh, a view towards this of of thinking to myself that if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and uh, <laughs> flies like a duck, then most likely it is a duck, right? And, uh, and that saying comes from uh, uh, a guy called uh, Vakisson um, back in the 17th century who made a mechanical duck, basically, who did all those things. Uh, um, but it actually, was, of course, it was completely mechanical. Um, but my view on this is, is I've, I've really focused on for my entire career now on family-based discoveries and focusing on families with inherited forms of Parkinson's disease that most closely resemble typical garden variety, mostly late onset Parkinson's disease. So much so that you can't distinguish them apart um, clinically or even pathologically. And we've come up with a number of genes. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them and, and what they mean because they're converging around a central problem. And the problem, I think, is here. Uh, I pointed it, and everyone's like, what is that? <laughs> it's actually a synapse. It's the connection under electron microscope at 20,000 times. Um, is it an A, or an A, or a B, or a B? Oh, um, oh, no, I do have a point there. It doesn't work. It's an A. So that's a classic synapse up there. 
Right. Right. The, um, does it work? Yes, it does. Oh. <laughs> I'm used to this, aren't I? Oh, okay. Okay, so this is the classical synapse, uh, pre and post synaptic density. These, oh, this is a classical synapse, and, and basically it's a connection between two nerve cells. Um, on this side, it's called the presynapse. Pre you see these little round dots? They're vesicles, little, little uh, packages of neurotransmitter, like dopamine, for example. And this side is, is a postsynaptic bouton. Um, I can come back to that if you like later on, but um, uh, the problem, all of these genes highlight a particular trafficking problem between the structures known as endosomes and vesicles in presynaptic terminals. So all of these proteins, all of these genes that have been implicated um, by my work so far. So I'll come back to it. Because I want to tell you more about stories, really, how I got there. So a lot of the work I do is concurrent. It takes years to map genes in families. Uh, it takes a very long time. It's a lot of effort. Um, and so I, I've embarked on many different journeys kind of at the same time. This is one of the most uh, famous examples, which was the discovery of a gene called uh, LERC2, leucine-rich repeat kinase 2. And um, we nominated it as the Rosetta Stone for Parkinson's disease because it helps translate different neurodegenerative pathologies that were found in these patients at end stage at death um, to the same single underlying genetic cause. So we found that family members in the same family with the same genetic mutation in LERC2 with clinical Parkinson's disease had different pathologies. Some had Lewy body pathology, some had tau pathology, some had TDP43 proteinopathy, different pathologies. We wrote the textbook not, now, not just the textbook in the sense of saying that Parkinson's disease might actually be heritable, but also that Parkinson's disease doesn't necessarily have to be a Lewy body disorder, highlighted by uh, synuclein stained Lewy bodies uh, in, in the midbrain at death. We wrote the textbook again. So the story comes from, from some work uh, with this fella. So this is my friend Jan. And, um, I bumped into him in a meeting in Kyoto in, um, in 2000 or so, and I was complaining to him that uh, I was a bit dejected at the time um, <clears throat> because um, I was having a bad day. But, um, but uh, I said to him, he was saying to me, I work at Mayo Clinic, I must be so rich in terms of samples and materials and clinical data because Mayo is world famous. And I said, well, the the problem is, Jan, that none of the buggers will give me any of it. They won't share any of their DNA specimens or any of their clinical data. And if they do, they want to keep me blinded to everything. They want to direct the studies. They want to tell me. And I basically just do the genetic analysis for them, but they basically direct it and tell me what to do. And I said, the problem is they don't know what they're doing. And uh, they don't really understand uh, that their experimental design is... is uh, is going to fail, or probably going to, it's not, not going to have the best chances of success. And he said to me, uh, well, Matt, I've got lots of patients with Parkinson's disease, and um, I've got lots of blood samples. Do you want them? <laughs> and this, <clears throat> this is in, um, he's from Norway. He's the chair of neurology in a place called Trondheim, <clears throat> which is up here. <clears throat> Trondheim was the capital city of, of Norway a thousand years ago. It's where all the Vikings basically, uh, well, they, the Vikings kind of um, were united under King Harold, and King Harold, that's where he lived. And Jan, that's where Jan lives too. So Jan was very kind and gave me um, lots of DNA samples, and, we, and I said to him, well, I will support the genetic work, you support the clinical work. And, um, and I wrote to NIH at the time, National Institutes of Health, and I asked for money to do genetic analysis of Norwegian samples. And the US government said to me, yes, but we need to own everything. We need to own the samples. We need to own uh, the results. We need, to, we need to have the intellectual property. We need to be able to have the commercialization rights and all of this stuff. And I, 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 <laughs> so I, I said to Jan, Jan, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. The, uh, the US government, if they're going to fund this, they want to own everything. And, um, and he said to me, no problem, Matt. No problem, no problem. I'll go down to the butchers tomorrow. <laughs> and we'll get lots and lots of blood <laughs> and they can have it all 
<laughs> lots of Norwegian cows can contribute to this effort. Uh, no, <clears throat> seriously, yeah, actually, seriously, that's what he said. But I, um, but we worked with many families um, along the coast of, of Norway, and it turns out that that uh, we discovered that they have a mutation called G2019S. It's a mutation in LERC2, in leucine rich repeat kinase 2. And these are seven or so of the families. Each one of these lines represents um, the piece of DNA that they've inherited. This bit's like DNA is on chromosome 12, Q12. And, um, and it turns out that all these families that down the coast, um, but basically they're all related back to a 15th century founder. And we can figure that out by looking at their relationships and looking at their genealogy. It's quite, quite remarkable. Um, but the weird thing was at the time, and this is 2004, 2005, is that we, I also found families with the same haplotype, the same piece of DNA in the States, in my, uh, who were living in the United States, and from Ireland and from Poland. And I started, um, I had a Spanish student at this time, Nacho, and he brought over some samples from northern Spain. They also had G2019S mutations at a higher frequency than, than uh, Jan's uh, material. And, um, and it occurred to me that this is very strange, you know, that there's one basically huge pedigree across the planet. Because all these people, whether they're Spanish or Polish or living in the States or Norwegians, have the same piece of DNA inherited identical by descent. It's identical by descent. So they're all cousins, distant, distant cousins, but they're all relatives. So how could that be? And going down, basically, oh, sorry. It, it took me on a bit of a journey. Oh, thanks. It took me on a bit of a journey, basically, um, down through Europe um, and into North Africa. And I'm going to take you there with me in a minute. Um, but before we go there, one thing about G2019S, it breaks this segment of DNA. Uh, of, so DNA genes encode proteins. Proteins are the kind of functional units of cells that allow them to, um, to, to work. Um, LERC2 protein has this piece within it. This is the kinase segment. And this is the activation segment of that kinase. And G2019S, the amino acid, is right here. And actually breaks the hinge of this flap of protein, which normally keeps this. You can see there's a little pocket here, right? little hole, normally keeps that filled. But when it's not filled, other proteins can come in here and be phosphorylated and, um, and activated. It's, um, it's a classical secondary messenger signaling, sig signaling mechanism that many different proteins use, and it's been very well described uh, in many different protein families. And many drug companies, here's the important thing, have kinase inhibitors on their shelves looking for a disease to, uh, to apply them to. And so the idea is, of course, to get pharma companies engaged to, uh, to have a look at their, look, uh, their particular kinase inhibitors and see whether one of them might be a good fit for, for LERC2. Sure enough, that's what we've done. Um, in 2003, Bill Langston came to see me, or 2002, and asked me to be on the board of the Fox Foundation. And it was very, it was very nice. It was very small at the time. There was only about a dozen people, less than that, actually, about eight people. And I told Fox Foundation at the time, and I told Michael, we've got this LERC2 discovery, and it looks pretty interesting. You know, it's a few families in Norway and, and um, the United States and Ireland so far, but there seems to be more in, in northern... Um, okay. But there seems to be more in, in um, moving down through, through Europe and... Uh, and, you know, Parkinson's disease is a sporadic disease. So how come we've got all these individuals with the same mutation, many of them denying that they have any family history of the disorder at all, right? Just don't see it in their family. They look sporadic, but they have the same segment of DNA. But anyway, I said to Fox, it's a kinase. And competitive kinase inhibition is going to be a therapeutic for these individuals. It's going to be a therapeutic. Um, it took them five years before we convened a meeting, or they convened a meeting, with big pharma companies. And I sat in that room in New York. It was wonderful at the end of a table. And with all these with Pfizer and Merck and, and GlaxoSmithKline. And, uh, and, you know, we rolled up our sleeves and we said, right, boys, how are we going to do this? <laughs> is, they wanted to know, is the market going to be big enough? 
is there going to be enough patients out there who'd get benefit from such a drug? Would they get the money back, basically, if they make this investment? You know? um, there's loads of challenges. How are you going to persuade somebody who's perhaps early in, in the course of their disease to take a drug periodically for the rest of their life? Right? How are you going to persuade them to do that? Um, you have to know that the drug's efficacious. You have to know it works. And it, has to, it can't have side effects. All drugs have side effects. How are you going to do that? Um, so there's lots and lots of challenges around it. So I've been trying to solve them one after another. And I'll take you through some of the, some of the ways I've been doing it. So we know it's a target. We know it's prevalent around the world. We know low kinase inhibitors can block that site. Um, I didn't say, but just from the looking at the amino acid signature and, and realizing that the hinge here is broken, this kinase is constitutively active. And basically, we need an inhibitor to make it less active. It's very simple. Simple things are always the best. So I, um, I carried on my journey, and I went down to, um, I went to uh, actually a meeting, the Academy of Neurology meeting in 2005. And uh, I had the good fortune there of, of, of meeting a, a fellow called Faisal Hentati. Uh, the meeting was contrived. It was already fixed for me to meet him. Uh, he's the chair of neurology in Tunis. Um, that's Faisal there. We had a Skype call about two weeks, well, last weekend, actually. Uh, he's a good guy. He's retiring, unfortunately. But, um, but he's been the director of this institute in Tunis, in Tunisia, in North Africa here, for the last 38 years, uh, which is a very long time to be in one position in, in that part of the world. And uh, this is Rachel Gibson. She actually works for GlaxoSmithKline. So I went with her. Oh, this was on one of the trips. I go to Tunis, Tunisia about every year, every, every year or every other year to visit Faisal. Because it turns out that one in three patients, 30% of all patients in Tunisia, has a lurk 2 g 2019 s mutation. One in three of the patients he sees, it's huge. And if they've got a family history, it's 40% 40, 40 of patients. Uh, so it's enormous. But a lot of people there don't have a family history, but they have the mutation. Um, <coughs> with Pfizer, we've been, and Jan, been looking at the disease, and there's some interesting things. So these, for example, here is, is the uh, data from the, from, from the Berbers in North Africa. And we've got... Ashkenazi Jewish data alongside, and this is Norwegian data, and what's shown is, um, is the probability of being affected if you have a G2019S mutation. Now, if, and this is age. So if you're Norwegian and you have a G2019S mutation, your probability of being affected at a particular age, say 70 years of age here, is only like, I don't know, 30, 40%. But if you're Tunisian, Berber, you're very likely to have the disease by that age. So what's the difference? Salmon eating, I don't know, Mediterranean diet, <laughs> something. <coughs> Got to figure it out, right? There's a big difference in, in penetrance. The term is penetrance. One of, the, one of the conundrums here. From a drug company point of view, they have to be assured that the patients that they're treating, in some ways, are all going to have a similar type of... I mean, the, the best type of... Uh, trial design that they could have is for the patients to have a uniform demise, to everybody have the same incremental demise in their disease, so that they could, when they apply a drug, they could see if it's having benefit or not. If, if it's very random, some people have very um, malignant disease, go downhill very fast, some people don't, you know, stay very continual, very low dose levodopa for a, it's, it's harder in a clinical trials design, and this is for a neuroprotective drug that's actually going to prevent that decline. So penetrance is something they, they thought long and hard about. It's been a challenge. One of the things I was thinking long and hard about is why is this mutation so prevalent, so frequent, I should say, in North Africa? Why is it found in 30% of patients? Why is it found in 1.9% of all Berbers in North Africa? You know, a single mutation, mutations happen all the time in, in us, um, but they're very rare, rare and, and they're, they're eradicated. They don't pass on to the next generation, typically, and, and they don't accumulate, and they don't increase in frequency at a population level, unless there's something driving it. And this is an example of this. This is the sort of work I actually do. Um, so this is looking at 
a positive selective sweep in the genomes of individuals with lurk 2 g 19 s on chromosome 12. And this big, he, big pile of dots there is what's known as an integrated haplotype score. It's telling me that this piece of the genome has been positively selected for in this population. Um, why or how? I don't know. Because by the time people get Parkinson's disease, they've already had children, their families. It's got nothing to do with their Parkinson's disease per se. It's got some other reason. There's some other benefit to having lurk 2 g 19 s in terms of biological fitness. And it turns out there's a reason for that. Because lurk 2, lurk 2 variability, not g 19 s itself, but other lurk 2 variants, have been implicated in inflammatory bowel disease, in Crohn's disease, in pediatric autoimmune disease. This one I find really interesting, which is called type 1 reaction in leprosy. So it turns out that a lot of families uh, with leprosy in the family, with M. leper A infection in the family, a lot of people who are born in those families don't actually realize. Sorry. That's all right. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> A lot of people that are born, in, born in those families don't actually realize they're infected with M. leprae. And they, they, they find out because they get all these big red wheels of blotchy skin, uh, which is really, really sore and painful. It's like shingles on steroids. It's not good. It's called type 1 reaction. And only 50, but only 50% of uh, family members will get something like that, like that type 1, uh, type 1 reaction. And the reason why it turns out is because because of LERC2 variability. People with specific LERC2 variants um, basically are, they don't ever manifest type 1 reaction. It's quite amazing. So LERC's got a major role in immunity, in innate immunity. It's very highly expressed in leukocytes, in white blood cells, and uh, it has a role to play uh, between host pathogen responses in, um, against infectious disease. Now, what the infectious disease is, Berbers traditionally, I don't like this, traditionally li um, li live, with, uh, live with their animals. They're goat herders, right? Um, so I, 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 don't know what the, uh, I don't know what the culprit here is, but this is something that's happened over thousands of years of evolution, right? But there's a relationship between lurk 2 variability and biological fitness. And there's also a relationship between LERC2 variability and Parkinson's disease. It's a double-edged sword. I, um, <clears throat> it still wasn't enough, though, you know, because the drug company said to me, Matt, well, that's all well and good. You know, you, you found this in 30% of Berbers in North Africa, but they've got no money. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said, and I was very insistent, I said, well, yeah, if, if, if these individuals are going to be the guinea pigs in a clinical trial, then we have to make sure that the drugs are available at a generic price, you know? And that's something that, you know, <laughs> GlaxoSmithKline and, <clears throat> I don't want to name names, <laughs> they don't want to hear, all right? Uh, these are for-profit companies. Uh, so trying to get this done and, and, and make, it wasn't enough. The market's not big enough, Matt, they told me. So I had this remarkable finding here. This was actually one in 2007. And since, since two, it's another long story. I've got so many stories, and I'm probably not weaving them together very well at all. But um, <clears throat> I'm looking at Larry, because he's probably going to shake his head, yeah. But um, <clears throat> when, I, when I was, um, when I first started out I, uh, at Mayo, I had a young medical student come and see me from Taiwan. And she, um, or, um, she told me that she'd come across this family. Oh, I've got another one. Okay, thanks. She told me she came, oh, that better. She, she, she told me she came across this family, and um, the grandmother had been born under a curse, and they were, she really wanted to help find out what the um, she was a medical student. She wanted to find out what this genetic curse was. It was a family with, with familial Parkinson's disease, so she came to the right place, knocking at my door, and I said to her, "Well, okay, well, we have to collect different branches of the family. You'll have to go to Taiwan. We'll have to meet some folks. I don't know anybody. I looked them up on the phone book, and I found, I found a name, Rui Mei Wu, who's the head of neurology in Taipei. And Rui Mei, I called her up and said, Rui Mei, can you help me? Because I, I need to send this young medical student to you to collect this other family in, 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 tai, in Taiwan with a familial form of Parkinson's disease. And, and that started a long relationship with, uh, with Rui Mei. I've had ever since. 
Um, we solved that family for that medical student. We solved that. We found that gene, by the way. <clears throat> but working in Taiwan um, gave me access to lots and lots of samples from Asia. And it turned out, so when we discovered LERC2, I thought, well, let's have a look at Asia and Parkinson's disease patients with sporadic Parkinson's disease in Asia and see what we found. And we found this. <clears throat> it's called, um, it's another LERC2 variant. It's called G2385R. And um, we find it in between 6 to 8%. So it's not a huge number, but 6 to 8% of all patients with Parkinson's disease in Asia. So we found it in Taiwan to start with. But uh, it's since been reported in China. We since looked in Korea, in Japan. There's been studies done in Singapore. And it's across all of those, across the whole of Asia, 6 to 8% of all patients have a G2385R mutation in LERC2 again. Right? It's remarkable. And that got drug companies interested because <laughs> they're thinking, ka market. We've got the market. It's worth the investment. All right? That's a wonderful thing. And the other wonderful thing, and you probably don't get it from this, but this is a bit of chromosome 12, and, and these are what are known as microsatellite markers. This is the mutation here, G2385R. Um, but they have a segment of DNA, these individuals, um, <clears throat> uh, that's, again, inherited identical by descent. So everybody with G2385R in Asia is a cousin. Isn't that amazing? You don't find the G2385R, by the way, in Caucasian populations. It's only in Asia. And, um, and I think it's uh, 4,800 years old, because you can date mutations, just like you can radiocarbon fossils and things. Um, you can date mutations based on the variability. It's about 4,800 years old. That's when it arose originally. And it's, um, and it's basically spread. Why has it gone from that one mut mutation to be now in 6 to 8% of all Parkinson's patients in Asia. Something has driven it, a positive selective advantage. Right? So what I'm trying to get to by telling you this in part is that I see from my world view of Parkinson's disease patches of Parkinson's disease around this planet. In Berbers in North Africa, I didn't really talk about Ashkenazi Jews, but Ashken it might come up, I've got loads of slides on that too. In Ashkenazi Jews, in the Basque region of northern Spain, R1441G in northern Spain, um, you see these patches, and in Asia, you see these patches of Parkinsonism. Um, okay, these are all examples of LERC2 variability, but, and, and the patients in those regions, for example, they look sporadic, Parkinson's disease. They don't have any family history, particularly, of Parkinson's disease. Some of them do. That's how we mapped LERC2 in the first place clearly segregating down the family line in these big pedigrees. But many, many, the majority don't have a family history, but they have the same variants inherited identical by descent. It's curious, huh? I've got some thoughts about it that I'll share with you later. Um, I'm not going to talk about, I, we've mapped penetrance modifiers, we've made mice, the mice are fantastic. By the, by the way, the... Um, to give you some insight of why mice models are important, the average mouse dopamine neuron has about 450,000 terminal boutons. You know that synapse I showed you? That little presynaptic bouton? They have about 450,000 of them per axon, right? And they have about 10,000 or so plus of those axons innovating the striatum. In human beings, a single dopaminergic neuron, a single dopamine neuron, has about between 1 and 2.5 million terminal boutons in the striatum. This is complex biology, right? So you need the complex system, brain, to be able to model it. So I do a lot of the modeling in mice. We've made mice with LERC2 knock-ins, LERC2 knockouts, um, with these particular mutations, and we've started to really understand the biology. And we've worked with pharma companies to make the drugs. So they're now LERC2 compounds, kind of Competitive kinase inhibitors in clinical trials. Denali's got a phase one trial going on right now, and GSK have got a trial going on right now. Just for phase one, just safety. But they're waiting to see. They need something else. They need to show uh, engagement in a biologically relevant way, all right, to show that the drugs are actually hitting the right target at the right dose and having the right effect to slow down or stop the disease. Right? That's a challenge. 
But I think we've solved that one too. Um, I'm not going to talk about Galchets. I could, I could do I don't know. I probably don't have enough time. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but we've done this time. So Galchets is another example with uh, uh, glucocerebrosidase mutations. Again, now in clinical trials, there's two or three trials going on. Uh, basically, precision medicine trials, basically um, targeting individuals with particular variants in GBA. Uh, we found these mutations in VPS35. This is a story that a good friend of mine, a Swiss neurologist, uh, uh, no longer with us, sadly, but he described this family to me, this top kindred here, and we did um, comparative genome sequencing in the family and, and basically found another um, cause of disease uh, known as the retromer. And uh, this is the protein here, and it has a particular mutation, D620N. Um, and it's in lots of endosomal biology I'm not going to tell you about, but um, kind of long story short, I think. The, um, we've made mice. They have fantastic dopamine uh, biology. It's fantastic. And I can tell you all about it, but you, probably more than you want to know. When I say it's fantastic, it's... it's um, uh, it's something tangible, it's something you can measure. Uh, it doesn't have any effects on the mouse's motor behavior at all. The mouse looks normal, fine. It's only when you stimulate a brain slice electrically or pharmacologically do you see this response. And what you see in, the, in these mice with the mutation is, is twice the peak amplitude of dopamine being um, liberated in, in the synaptic cleft of those animals. That's an assay for drugs, to be able to measure the efficacy of drugs. And my long story short here is, um, is this. You're kind of the first people to see this. This is LERC2 kinase inhibitors being applied to a mouse model with a VPS35 D620N mutation. Two different genes for late onset Parkinson's disease that for all intents and purposes affect two different systems, two different proteins, have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. But it turns out that LERC2 kinase inhibitors, uh, they're shown here, actually fix the problem in the VPS35 mice. They fix that dopaminergic release. So that, that gives me the first um, major clue of a, of a biologically uh, relevant assay that drug companies can now use to show, test, to show the efficacy of lactokinase inhibitors in human beings. I can tell you more about the details if, if you really want. But I want to share this another family with you. Families like to share sepia photographs with me, and I think it's a great way of telling a story uh, because none of the people can nowadays be identified. It keeps the confidentiality of the families involved. Um, but um, a family in Saskatchewan shared this photograph with me. All of these boys in this photograph got Parkinson's disease in a big family, big Mennonite family in Saskatchewan. And I was very, very privileged to go to church with them and, uh, and to give a little sermon <laughs> about the Book of Life <laughs> and, uh, from the pulpit, and I thought they were going to lynch me. So I was, I was getting ready to run, and, uh, but they weren't. Um, it was a meeting like this, actually, we each table, and each table was a cousin branch of the family, and they'd come from five different provinces across Canada to be there and to take part, and they all gave me blood samples. We were there until like the early hours of the morning, uh, getting blood samples and spit samples from, from the entire, from 120 people. It was incredible. And we mapped the gene. <laughs> and this, this is another gene, it's called receptor-mediated endocytosis 8. It fits into the VPS35 story and it will fit into the, uh, into the LERC2 story, ultimately. And we started doing some biology on it. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up, because I think I better. The last, uh, the most recent discovery that we've made is actually 2017. That's a gene for early onset Parkinson's disease. So I often get people coming to see me and say, can they take part in studies? And it costs a lot of money to sequence people's genomes. But I do it. We do it. We find the money. Um, but I try and be pragmatic about this and focus that money on people with uh, unusual disease, complex disease, earlier onset disease, family history of disease. Um, of Parkinson's disease to make the most out of it. Um, this is a patient who got the disease at 13 years of age. He's deceased now. 
Uh, he died in his 70s. But he's got, his onset was 13. And it turns out um, he has a knockout of a gene called DNAJC12, um, along with an Italian family that we also sequenced. And you can see it here with, also with early onset. I think they're in their 20s and 30s at onset with the disease. And <clears throat> we've managed to basically put that genome information into the web to make it accessible to professionals who have the right ethics and approvals to view it. Um, to, to, make, to, to, to join people together so that I don't have to go to Italy or Saskatchewan or Taiwan or North Africa anymore because I don't, you know, it's, it's fun and all, but I, uh, I'd rather stay here, uh, <coughs> to be honest. And, and uh, you know, one, seen one Sheraton hotel, you've seen them all, right? <laughs> so, so, so <laughs> um, seriously, it's, it's been a, a wonderful privilege. But that DNA is, is so that data from that DNA samples is now... Um, part of a system that we, we call NeuroSeq, which allows individuals to basically look at genetic information like this to find variants like DNA JC12 very quickly and identify new genes for disease. So I'm going to leave you where I am at the moment in the world, my world travels. I'm, I'm messing about in the Faroe Islands right now. And uh, this is the Faroe Islands. It's a group of 19 islands in, in the middle of the North Sea. And um, they have two to three times the prevalence of Parkinson's disease as British Columbia. Why? And it's clustered in villages as well. Where are they? It's clustered in villages on two islands, neighboring villages, but it's not simple genetics. It's complicated genetics. And what I'm getting to now is the idea of gene and environment working together. DNA has been my, my wheelhouse because it's bounded. There's only a finite number of nucleotides. There's only six uh, billion nucleotides. It's limited, right? Environment, there's more than six billion questions, exposures, a lifetime of things, right? It's very hard to pin down. So to pin it down properly, to do the best I can, I'm going to places that are really, really isolated, where people only leave. They don't emigrate and move there. They emigrate from there, and, um, and that's... The, the Pharaohs is a great example to look at gene environment interaction. So, but we are at the moment. Um, anyway, I'll stop because I've run over time already, I'm sure. Stay up here. Stay up here. So you can hear that it's a global disease and it's going to need a global intervention. And uh, all the work that Matt and your team and all your colleagues are doing is, is just fascinating. So thank you so much for sharing the, the journey with us. Uh, we do have uh, one of your, I don't know if you call them patients, research individual, uh, Larry Gifford and his wife, Rebecca, have agreed just to talk very briefly about the, the journey. Uh, from a patient and a caregiver perspective. Many of you will know Larry. He's uh, generously shared his story on the award-winning podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's, and has been really working hard to create more awareness about, about this disease. Uh, so please uh, join me up on the stage, if you would, Larry and Rebecca. I'm here to give the written exam. Is everybody ready for that? <laughs> uh, I, I'm Larry Gifford, my wife Rebecca, my son Henry over there. Uh, I was di diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's in August of uh, 2017. I was 45 years old. I probably had symptoms for up to eight years before that. Last April 11th on World Parkinson's Awareness Day, I started sharing my story. I was on global news, I was on uh, chorus radio stations across the country, I wrote a blog uh, and, and, and came out of the closet, I guess. Uh, and then last September, we launched the podcast, When Life Gives You Parkinson's, uh, to, uh, and I'm very uh, grateful for all the feedback we've received on that and, uh, and, and for everybody who's been willing to share their story along with mine on that podcast. Soon after I started sharing my story, I, I met Dr. Ferrer. Uh, and I was taken by his passion and his compassion. Um, it, it was really remarkable to, to meet somebody uh, who was so, 
doesn't have a connection to Parkinson's per se. It's not in his family, but he's working so hard to find that cure. And I didn't understand anything he said. <laughs> Alpha synuclein, lurk to Parkin. I'm like, what are you talking about? But I was enamored because he was really smart and I wasn't. And I, he must know something I don't know. Uh, so I felt like I needed to get closer to him. So I kind of bugged him a bit. And he invited me uh, to his lab at USC to uh, participate in some uh, genetic research. And he sat me down and he asked, uh, fill, we filled out a survey. And he was asking about my family background and my, my parents and, and my brothers and sister. And, uh, and then he said, uh, you need to sign this page to acknowledge what you're getting into. What am I getting into? Turns out there's, you know, quite a few concerns that people can have when they enter uh, into genetic testing and surrender their DNA. I, here are three of them. My entire sequence genome would be available to researchers around the world through the uh, NeuroSeq, um, and not just for PD research, but for, for any research. Um, is it safe? If, if something is found, if something is discovered in my genetic makeup, can it be used against me by a life insurer or a health insurer or somebody who has even more dastardly intentions? And what if analyzing my DNA, they discover another disease that I have a predisposition for? He's probably ethically obligated to tell me. And am I ready to open that door? Participating in the research is something I, I, I think is really important. And just to know that the data that was being extracted from me could potentially help researchers globally was exciting. But I, I really needed to come to terms with these three things. Is it safe? Yeah, yes, it's safe. With the advent of 23andMe and all the other genetic tests out there, uh, there have been uh, new laws implemented in Canada to protect us. Um, additionally, my name doesn't travel with my, my, my genome. And as I understand it, Matt, and you can correct me, the whole genome is not available to other scientists, just the specific chromosomes and genetic markers that they're exploring. So it's just the variants, like I said. Yeah, okay, yeah, we've heard enough from you. The final hurdle uh, was, am I ready to potentially learn about a pre predisposition to another disease? And I thought about it, and, I, and I'm like, well, I already got this brain thing. I got, I got Parkinson's, a genetic, or a, a, a progressive degenerative brain disease, so I might as well know what else I'm in, is in store so I can start preparing for that. So with due consideration, I moved forward. The test itself was... Nothing. He, he handed me a little bottle of mouthwash and had me swish it in my mouth and use my tongue on my teeth and my tongue on my cheek and then swish it around for about 45 seconds, which seems like a really long time when you're doing it. Uh, and then you spit into a vial and he seals it up, he labels it. Bam, done. So, so then he does what his voodoo. Uh, and, and two months later, I went back for my results. And he sat me down and explained that, Larry, you have 180,000 gene mutations. 180,000 seemed like a lot. Uh, but none of my mutations are known connections to Parkinson's. So as it relates to Parkinson's, he said, your genome is unremarkable. <laughs> and it was really the first time in my life I'm like, I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being unremarkable. So uh, he asked if I was disappointed, and I thought for a second, and, and uh, you know, I, I wasn't. Um, once your genome is mapped, it's mapped. Your genome doesn't change. But the science changes. What they know about the genome changes. So right now, they're doing all the research on the NeuroSeq. And in three or five or 10 years, we can push a button and recheck my genome and the, the notations along all my genetic connect, connections will be filled out further because they've done more research. So when we run it again, the story could be different. So that's, that, that will live there forever. Uh, the way I was interpreting it, and I told Dr. Fair this, is 
we, we had planted a seed of pure potential. We put it in the ground, and now we just wait and see if it bears fruit. I'm really honored to have been invited to participate. Um, I think it's really important for all of us to volunteer to do any kind of research because without us, without, without, without us raising our hands and stepping forward and saying, yeah, test me, new treatments won't be available. We won't be able to stop and, 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 and change this disease uh, for the next generations. Um, it's up to us to be willing to go out there and step forward. And in talking to researchers, it's really important right now, um, they're really stressing the need for more women and more people with ethnic diversity because we need a full picture of what this disease does. And from what they tell me, it's a bunch of uh, white guys that are stepping forward and helping out. And you know we're okay, but we don't tell the whole story. So we need everybody. Um, so, thanks, Matt, for uh, letting me participate. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, we've also invited Larry's wife, Rebecca, to just say a few words from the care partner's perspective. funny I've been telling Larry he's unremarkable for years <laughs> he wouldn't believe me no and you're remarkable in every way the society asked me to offer a care partner's perspective on Parkinson's research and I'm honored to do so the first thing I thought about was how I marvel at the work that Dr. Fair and others are doing I see it with fascination curiosity and most importantly a lot of hope for us caregivers and partners, a part of our job, our privilege really, is to watch our loved ones, to witness, and to be an ear. A responsive, active one at times, the truth teller, or BS caller, I like to call it. And sometimes simply a quiet, loving listener. When they struggle with the disease or volunteer for a study, there's only so much we can do. We can support as best we can and watch in wonder. But when it comes to the larger Parkinson's community and all of the wonderful people within it, there is so much more we all get to watch and appreciate, and yes, even participate in. When I hear about the great work that researchers like Dr. Ferrer are doing, I get excited. When I entertain the possibilities of the future in regards to their work and how that may help my husband and so many others, again, I have great hope. None of us is certain we will see a cure for Parkinson's in our lifetimes. But these researchers' true desire to help move the needle and improve the quality of life for those with Parkinson's and everyone around them, they give so much to a community in need of answers and, quite frankly, in need of hope. They offer us all a flicker of light on those days that may otherwise feel quite dark. For our family, I also have to say that supporting research through fundraising and study participation gives us a tangible, real way to help and engage. Through community participation, we get a small measure of perceived control, a way to clear some blue sky in a situation that can be cloudy with uncertainty. As a person who loves and shares her life with someone with Parkinson's, I am grateful to all those who have volunteered to participate to volunteer, to have their genome mapped, to raise funds or otherwise support the brilliant research being done. I'm grateful to organizations like the Parkinson's Society BC, to Dr. Ferrer, his team, his colleagues, and all the generous souls who have committed their time, energy, intelligence, creativity, and in many cases, their entire career to this work. You bring us in this room and the millions beyond a glimpse into what could be and you help us live more comfortably in what is. Thank you for all that you do. I can't wait to see what you discover next. So thank you, Larry and Rebecca. As uh, incredible as Matt's story is, I also wanted to have the, the uh, family connection come back 
uh, with their stories. And you can hear Matt's dedication that he is involved with the people. It's not just in the lab. So we're so, again, incredibly fortunate to have you here. Thank you. We do have uh, some time for questions. Uh, so uh, please do, I think uh, Caroline's got a microphone and do you, does somebody, Amy's got a microphone. Okay, we got one there already and then here. All right, fire away. Well, of all the people I joined the 23andMe uh, crusade when it started, uh, I don't think I've learned very much from that that uh, body, but the one strange thing now that I've heard your lecture today is that of all, I'm a typical white bread Northern European male from born in Britain, but I do have a very small percentage of Ashkenazi Jew uh, DNA, DNA or haplogroup in me. Is that worth following up? Uh, <coughs> so, so 20, so, so there, there are two uh, main uh, genetic variants <coughs> for, for Parkinson's disease in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. One's lurk 2 g 20 s that's pretty frequent. And the other is um, GBA and 370S. And so you can, I know that 23andMe uh, tests for lurk 2 g 20 s it's one of the markers on their, on, their, on their panel. GBA I'm not so sure about, um, but you could have a look. Um, so in, in the beginning, in the beginning, um, back, back in, actually back in 2009, I spent some time with um, Anne Wolczecki. And Anne is the uh, director or CEO of 23andMe. And uh, she was asking me about Parkinson's disease because her husband at, at the time, uh, his family has Parkinson's disease. Um, a lot of Parkinson's disease and they're, they're Russian Jewish. And so, um, so I gave her a list of variability in LERC2, full disclosure, and said, maybe you want to put that on the panel, you know? And, uh, uh, and they did. And I think it's been on every single uh, 23andMe test kit ever since. So, um, mea culpa maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but so you could have a look at that in those results. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, actually, my question was almost identical to the previous one, except for one addition. I have a Norwegian grandparent who had PD. So other than that, um, uh, I'm interested in this connection, though, between the Norwegian side the Ashkenazi Jewish side, which is on my mother, uh, my, that's my maternal and paternal line, um, and what to make of this. I mean, uh, if I go to 23andMe, they tell me I have a 1% chance of contracting PD in my life. Hmm. So, so 23andMe, 23andMe don't, don't sequence your genome. What they do, they run, they run a test of about 1.8, maybe it's two, two and a half million uh, single nucleotide variants. So you heard Larry say, I told him he's got 180,000 uh, variants, right? Um, but that, that comes from coding genes. So, so how do I put this? How do I explain this? Um, there's six billion nucleotides in the human genome, right? In total. <laughs> One percent of them encode genes that encode proteins. One percent of that information. Um, and what I do is really focus in on that coding variability. Now, 23andMe don't do that. Okay. They focus on a very common variants in the genome. They're like tags, if you like. Um, they're very common, they're very high frequency. Uh, they're not quite so specific. Every variant that they look at has a frequency in the population of at least 1%, if not 5% of people in the world have that variant. That's why it's on their chip. Okay. That's why it's on their chip. Um, what we do by comparison is we we sequence and we look for every single novel variant. Nobody else in the world may have that particular change, right? So it's, it's a different degree of resolution. It's a different degree of resolution. In terms of your background and heritage, it plays a big part in, in, um, 
in, in your susceptibility, but, but, but also in, in, in your ability to compensate, right? Okay. Um, so I find, for example, that in the Norwegian population, maybe it's diet, and maybe it's living in cold... What, fish again? Uh, yeah, maybe fish, <laughs> maybe it's diet, who knows? Um, but maybe it's got nothing to do with DNA, but for example, there, from a LERC2 point of view, G2019S patients get the disease at a lot, and when they're a lot older, in general, than, than Ashkenazi or, or, um, or, or Berbers, which is rather remarkable. I mean, it's, we're talking 15, 20 years later. So why is that? Um, we don't really have the answers to those questions. One thing I've been thinking about, and I can talk forever, by the way, so you're going to just shut me up. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> One thing I've been thinking about is this relationship between, you know, I started off with that, the first verse of... Of, of the book of John. Yes. In, in the beginning there was the word. And I, I have a fundamental philosophical belief that there's one piece of DNA originally in the world, right? And that one piece of DNA became all the oh. different plants and animals and species, became all of us. And its complexity has evolved over time. And the relationship of that one piece of DNA in us is it, that DNA is, <coughs> is co-evolving. We are co-evolving with everything else around us. With the two kilograms of bacteria in our gut, we've got more bacteria in our gut than we've got neurons in our brain, in terms of weight, right? <laughs> more cells. <clears throat> we are co-evolving together. And, and part of this picture of Parkinson's disease that we see around the planet, this late onset disease, which has nothing really to do with biological fitness, is a consequence of one being able to live longer and older, but also a consequence of, of, um, of of our genome having evolved to be biologically fitter when we're younger. And LERC2 variants are a big player in that, and immunity is a big player in that. And immune, what we find now from a lot of studies of different neurodegenerative diseases, whether it's dementia or Parkinson's disease or motor neuron disease, is that immune responses are major genetic factors in all of these disorders. And it's not acquired immunity, it's not like T cell responses, B-cell responses to some necessarily, it's innate immunity, it's an, it's an innate immu uh, immune issue. We don't know what it is, but that's what, the, we know the genes, and they underlie all of these late onset neurodegenerative diseases. To see this in patches in populations, I think is rather remarkable now. It's a new one for me. So now we have to figure out what the other, what the other piece is, you know, the other genome, the pathogen, you know, in those environments. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Lee. Uh, I was wondering, and the, I realize the background question, but I'll get to it. I have a half brother who's 13 years older, uh, younger than myself. Oh, nice years old. And I also have several first cousins with uh, their children and their children's children. And the background question is for whom is it useful? to consult the database, the gene, uh, genetic database you've referred to a number of times, and or yourself? So for, who, for whom is it useful? Um, yes, to consult that database in terms of, you know, uh, uh, predict, uh, uh, possibility of prediction. Yeah, <clears throat> so, so what, we're, what we're doing is we, we, we it costs about Oh, the price is coming down. It's within five years, it's going to be about $100 to completely sequence a whole human genome, right? But right now, only about, um, oh, what is it? Something like 1.5 million genomes on the planet have been sequenced out of the 9 billion people or so who live on this planet. And, um, and so the data that is available is actually quite scant. It's quite rare. So we're trying to make it accessible in the sense that it will help interpret uh, new genomes when they are sequenced, no matter what the disease, whether it's epilepsy or Parkinson's disease or kidney disorders or whatever, right? From a <clears throat> genetic point of view, we're very simplistic. We, I've talked about genes today and single genes causing disease. That's not true. Absolute nonsense, right? We've got 20,390 genes, probably more, and lots of non-coding RNAs as well, which I don't mention. Um, for reason, because they work together in concert. So to understand the contribution of two genes, three genes, five genes, 10 genes, polygenic disease, 
we're going to need very, very, very large sample sizes. Right, huge sample size. We're going to need the planet. So this is the first baby step <laughs> on the way to liberating genetic information for the planet, to understand the polygenic contribution of disease, and also to, to, to compensation too, to, to, for example, to pharmacy. Um, I would love to understand, you know, my mum is 87, and she takes 20 pills a day. She takes one for depression, she takes one for her heart, one for water tablet, you name it, 20 pills a day. And I think they're having a disastrous consequence on her metabolism. Uh, you know, because they're just kind of medica medications that she's been told to take or she'll die, right? But the truth is, if we sequenced her genome, I haven't done that for my mum, we might be able to give a better, uh, better advice on which drugs to take, which ones are actually beneficial, at what dose, um, and which combinations we could... We, it could help a great deal to know that genetic information in my mum, and just to think of how pharmacy works in that person. Just as an example. Um, Are you talking about now or in the future? I'm talking about now. Um, dyskinesias in Parkinson's disease. We know that some people have genetic variability in their dopamine D2 receptor um, that makes them more prone to get dyskinesias in Parkinson's disease. But what neurologist ever recommends that you'd have a genetic... Uh, would look at that genetic information before they prescribe, for example, a, an adjunct medication for dyskinesias for you. N none. But we already know that there's a genetic basis for disc in part for dyskinesias. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that information is useful to a lot of communities, a lot of uh, physicians, a lot of basic neuroscientists. It could, be it could be useful to the individual as well. But it can only be really useful to the individual if it's annotated, interpreted from all the information that's out there in the world in aggregate. So our system, the thing that we built is basically a way of pulling together all the contemporary data from all the different databases in the world and hooking them together, mainlining them, right, uh, in the same system in a contemporary way. So when you look at the genome of an individual or a group of individuals, you can see it being reanalyzed. It's almost like it's fresh every time I open the page. All right, it's pretty remarkable. So I'm going to take one more question. Uh, we have, we're getting some very lengthy responses from you, Dr. Kerr. <laughs> 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 I know there's another day that we might have enough afterwards and ask these questions. So, Kerr? Uh, my question is, has to do with the prevalence of the disease of Parkinson's disease in uh, two, two different populations. I think you showed prevalence was much higher in the Berbers than it was in any other population. Could this difference in prevalence be explained by the number of copies of the gene in the population? And, uh, with the, well, the, the one population having many more copies of the gene and that having some effect on the uh, development of the disease. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not in, in that, in, in LERC2, it's not, that's not the case. Um, I can give you a very lengthy answer, but the short ones, no. <laughs> I'd love to give you a really lengthy answer. <laughs> no, uh, obviously, this man has got an uh, intelligence and a range of knowledge that, that most of us do not. Uh, we do appreciate uh, I think your presentation was wonderful and you gave us that incredible connection from uh, globally with people and researchers and all these samples and it's a big huge effort. I know you're making incredible progress and we, we, we know you're giving such hope to the community so thank you so much for sharing that with us.